Hi, I'm Dan Burke, movie critic and host of Words on Film. You can hear my show on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. on Boston Free Radio. Check me out at bostonfreeradio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio and Scat V. I'm your host, Dan Burke, host and movie critic. This is where I review the top movies and tell you which ones you should see and which ones you should pass up. I got a brand new rating system that I will talk about later in the show, but first, I'm going to give you the box office winners, the top 10 at the box office this past weekend. So, topping the box office for the second week in a row, no surprise for people who've been paying attention, is The Avengers Age of Ultron. So, the movie made less than it did last weekend, as predicted, but, again, it made a lot more. In fact, I think it made literally five times more, maybe even six times more, than the number two at the box office. And that, and so, it made $77.8 million this weekend, a total box office gross of $313.4 million total in just two weeks, and that was against a budget of $250 million. So it would be somewhat duplicitous to call The Avengers Age of Ultron a tentative hit. I'm going to call it a certified hit because even though it hasn't made twice as much as it cost to make, it's on its way there and it will probably make twice as much as it cost to make in about two weeks or so, I think. Number two of the box office this weekend is Hot Pursuit, which is also the number one debut movie of the weekend. This movie stars Reese Witherspoon, Sofia Vergara, and is one of the two movies I'll be reviewing for you for this show. So Hot Pursuit made $13.9 million this weekend, and that is against a projected estimated budget that has been undisclosed, but is probably no more than $20 million. Probably the bulk of the budget was used to hire Reese Witherspoon, I would imagine, but regardless. Number three at the box office this weekend is The Age of Adeline, which has surprisingly climbed up. It's gotten relatively decent reviews. Uh, I didn't think it was that great, but of course, other people, particularly women, probably disagree with me. And what's interesting is it actually, for the very first time, made more than Furious 7 did in a week. Interesting. Sit on that one. So The Age of Adeline made $5.8 million this weekend, a total box office gross of $31.8 million, and that is against an estimated budget of $25 million. So The Age of Adeline, while it wasn't a great movie, is still a tentative hit, no doubt. Furious 7 is number 4 at the box office this weekend, making $5.4 million this weekend, a total box office gross of $338.6 million, and that is against an estimated budget of $190 million. So, Fast and Fur- excuse me, Furious 7, which is technically Fast and Furious 7, if you want to be technical, is, has not quite made twice its budget back, But it's on its way there. What's interesting to note is that, yes, Furious 7 was number one at the box office for four straight weeks and is inevitably on its way down, but it made $338 million in six weeks. Avengers Age of Ultron made $313 in two weeks. And I did say that the Avengers Age of Ultron might make all its money back in two weeks, and now that I think about that, it might even be three weeks, but... Regardless, it will definitely make, it will definitely match Furious 7's 338.6 and maybe even exceed that in the next week. That's my prediction. Number five at the box office this weekend is a movie that's received terrible reviews but is still hanging in there. The movie is Paul Blart Mall Cop 2. It earned $5.3 million this weekend, a total box office gross of $58.2 million. And that is against a budget of $30 million. So Paul Blart Mall Cop 2 is on its way to making twice its budget back. And when it does, it will be a certified hit. Ex Machina is number 6 at the box office this weekend, probably earning, I think, what is a record for the movie, although I don't remember the statistics from last week. Ex Machina earned $3.5 million this weekend, a total box office gross of $15.8 million, 
And that is against an estimated budget of 11 million pounds, not dollars, pounds, which is roughly six and a half million dollars, excuse me, 16 and a half million dollars. Let me repeat that. 11 million pounds is equal to 16 and a half million dollars or thereabouts and change. So ex machina is on its way to making all its money back and it'll probably do so in the next week or so because ex machina is being elevated by way of word of mouth. At first it was playing in the art house cinemas, but now the multiplexes are getting word of this movie. Home. In its seven weeks in release, it earned $3.1 million this weekend, a total box office gross of $162.2 million total, and that is against an estimated budget of $135 million. So Home is a tentative box office hit. Woman in Gold, also getting word of mouth from the indie circuit, earned $1.7 million this weekend, a total box office gross of $27.1 million, and that is against an estimated budget of $11 million. So, Woman in Gold, despite never having been in the top five of the highest box office grocers, is a certified hit and will probably make three times its budget sooner than you think. Cinderella, Disney's big hit before The Avengers Age of Ultron, is number nine at the box office this weekend, earning one point. $7 million this weekend, a total box office gross of $196.3 million, and that is against an estimated budget of $95 million. So Cinderella did it. It made twice its money back, and more than that, making it indeed a certified hit and another huge profiter for Disney. Cybernatural, or rather Unfriended, Cybernatural was its original name, and I think a better name, but Unfriended is the one it has in theaters. In its fourth week in release is still doing really well for itself. It earned $1.5 million this weekend, a total box office gross of $31 million, and that is against a budget of $1 million. So Unfriended literally made 31 times its money back. And it's definitely never been number one at the box office, and it might have been in the top five once, but Cybernatural, despite the fact it's never been number one, has made 31 times its money back and is therefore a certified hit with very, very impressive numbers indeed. to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio and now watching us on SCAT TV. So, welcome to the program. My name is Dan Burke. I'm your host and movie critic. And this is the show where I review the latest movies and maybe even give you a little bit of movie news when I have time. So the first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you for the show is Hot Pursuit. Hot Pursuit is the PG-13 rated comedy action movie starring We starring Reese Witherspoon and Sofia Vergara, amongst other people. And it's about an uptight and by-the-book cop who tries to protect the outgoing widow of a drug boss as they race through Texas pursued by crooked cops and murderous gunmen. So the plot of the movie can be described pretty quickly, as I just described it in less than 15 seconds. But also, Hot Pursuit is very similar to a lot of buddy action comedies, but it reminded me probably the most of the movie Midnight Run, directed by Martin Brest and starring Robert De Niro and Charles Grodin. Now, despite the star power of this movie, and despite the 
director being as famous as he was, having directed Scent of a Woman and, unfortunately, Geely, but let's forget about that movie, Midnight Run was actually probably one of the most underrated buddy comedies out there. So, Midnight Run is very similar to Hot Pursuit in the sense that instead of a cop, Robert De Niro plays a bounty hunter, and he's actually out to find a criminal who's played by Charles Grodin and bring him back so De Niro himself can profit from it. So, it's, again, as I said, one of the most underrated buddy comedies out there. And if Hot Pursuit doesn't remind you of Midnight Run, you probably haven't seen it. But I'm not saying that Hot Pursuit is a ripoff of Midnight Run by any means. It's a movie that's, in a sense, very formulaic. But it has some laughs. But overall, I was actually kind of disappointed because I figured with Reese Witherspoon and Sofia Vergara, both of whom have proven themselves to be funny in other movies and in Sofia Vergara's case, TV shows with Modern Family, I expected this movie to be funnier. And it says a lot when this movie that runs at 87 minutes has fewer laughs than a 23 or 24 minute episode of The Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, which I just started binging on on Netflix. So, there wasn't a lot that was funny in this movie, and I think part of the reason the film wasn't funny was because the dialogue, for the most part, was uninspired, and the story itself was very predictable. In fact, there were some parts that, other than a plot twist in the middle, which I won't give away, there were parts and lines that I almost sort of saw coming. And certainly, the, the way the, the story sort of went along, I could kind of tell which way the story was going. But more than that, there, my definition of a good comedy is when there are logical people who are doing logical things and bad things still happen to them. Bad comedies are where seemingly smart people do relatively unintelligent things. And I say seemingly smart not because the characters themselves who are doing a certain action are stupid, but because the story itself relies on them doing relatively stupid things when they could do something smart. What do I mean by that? Well, for example, there are scenes in this movie where Reese Witherspoon's character and Sofia Vergara's character are trying to clear their name. So Reese Witherspoon changes out of her police uniform, and into civilian clothing. Well, there are other parts where she realizes she's wanted by the police through no fault of her own. That's She's just been framed. And she goes around trying to steal people's cars. And there's one part where she gets caught by one of the owners of the car, who's played by Jim Gaffigan, who's usually funny, but in this movie he didn't really have very much to do. But... There's a part where Jim Gaffigan is saying, oh, I'm going to call the police on you, and Reese Witherspoon's character is begging him not to. Well, the logical thing that she should do in her position as a police officer is show Jim Gaffigan's character her badge, or do something like that. But it doesn't occur to her character to do that. And what's odd is it doesn't seem like Reese Witherspoon's character is dumb. In fact, she's very smart. A little clumsy, but smart. So then there's this really convoluted scene where Sofia Vergara's character tries to save Reese Witherspoon's character by pretending they're a lesbian couple. And not that I'd want, not that I wouldn't want to see the two be in a lesbian scene together, but that's just my fantasies <laughs> getting carried away from me. But the scene that follows is very contrived. And overall, just flat out not funny. Hot Pursuit almost fell into the same sort of comedy traps that last year's The Other Woman did with Cameron Diaz and Leslie Mann in the sense that you have these seemingly smart women who are almost sort of tripping over themselves for a laugh. It may be because of their self-consciousness or it may be because the story doesn't give their characters very much else to do. 
So unfortunately, Hot Pursuit was not the movie it could have been or should have been. And I mentioned Reese Witherspoon's character, but there, there were also some other scenes where Reese Witherspoon is almost even more self-conscious than I told you she was. There are scenes where she's walking, and it's really hard to describe this on the radio. The people who are watching me on TV will probably see that she's walking really stiffly and almost sort of using her arms as somewhat a power walk. And it just almost seemed like a very self-conscious move. It almost is as if Reese Witherspoon is supposed to be a rigid by-the-book cop, and so she's walking as if she is one. And Reese Witherspoon is a better actress than this. Hell, she's an Academy Award winner. Similarly, I thought Sofia Vergara, more so in this movie than in Modern Family, really tried way too hard for a laugh. There's one scene where it's discovered, where she's told by Reese Witherspoon's character that her husband has been killed, and the way she cries is A, too brief, and B, almost like she's doing an imitation of Lucille Ball. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And getting back to my discussion about the movie Hot Pursuit, there is a lot to admire about Hot Pursuit. Not only does it star two actresses who are generally funny, but it also is directed by a woman a woman by the name of Ann Fletcher, who has also directed other movies such as The Guilt Trip from two years ago. This is the one with Seth Rogen and Barbara Streisand. And she directed The Proposal, the almost sort of comeback movie for Sandra Bullock, also co-starring Ryan Reynolds. Um, on the downside, she's directed 27 Dresses and Step Up, which nobody can argue are particularly good films, but The Proposal was much better, and Guilt Trip, which I haven't seen, uh, is a movie for which I've heard good reviews. I'm surprised I haven't heard it. I haven't seen it either, because I'm usually a big Seth Rogen fan, but that one sort of passed me by, if you will. But Hot Pursuit is a movie that could have been good, but was unfortunately not. And I think the reason for that was the writers, who are both male probably should have done... A, a woman, if she had written this, probably would have done a better job. And there is no shortage of funny women in Hollywood, unfortunately. And probably the biggest dead ringer about how a man wrote this movie and didn't know a thing about women is the fact that there's one scene where... Sofia Vergara and Reese Witherspoon are in the backseat of a police cruiser with compatriots that Reese Witherspoon's character knows, and Reese Witherspoon realizes that these cops are crooked and are not going to bring them back to the police station, but may actually kill them. So she makes up this stupid story about Sofia Vergara's character having... A period. And the way Sofia Vergara describes that period is A, not funny, and B, dumbfoundingly stupid. So stupid, in fact, that these two smart cops, who are crooked, by the way, and that's not giving much away, it's, it's revealed near the beginning, toward the middle of the movie, absolutely buy it. So they let them out of the car to take care of their, and I quote, lady business. If a woman had written that scene, it would have been a lot better. Or maybe it was sort of improvised, but it was one of those scenes that just, again, felt really contrived and was almost in there for a cheap laugh and to get the plot rolling in a way that almost equally seemed cheap. So... There aren't a lot of surprises in Hot Pursuit. I thought Reese Witherspoon was funny when she wasn't trying so hard, and the same could be said about Sofia Vergara. I thought the plot could have been a lot better. I thought the plot twists could have been more conducive to the story. And there were other things in the movie that just didn't make any logical sense. And when things don't make logical sense in a standard comedy, then you're just inviting crickets. <laughs> what I mean by that, you're just telling your audience not to laugh. 
So Hot Pursuit is a miss for me. And before I give you my official rating for Hot Pursuit, I might as well tell you about my brand new rating system. Before this show, for the last year or so, I've actually been rating movies by a six-tier rating system. If the movie was excellent, Oscar-worthy, and maybe not necessarily Oscar-worthy, but definitely moving and or well worth seeing on the big screen, I would give it my rating of a platinum egg. If it had a few problems, but it was still well worth seeing and above average, I'd give it a gold egg. If it was a good movie, but sort of slightly above average, I'd give it a good egg. If it was a bad movie, I'd give it a bad egg. If it was a really bad movie, I'd give it a rotten egg. And if it was a terrible, terrible movie with which you should not waste your time, I would give it the rating of rotten egg. Well, I'm tired of using eggs. So I'm debuting my new rating system, which I wanted to be more finite and also a little bit more related to movies than eggs are. The reason I used the egg system was, first of all, for, for lack of a better rating, and secondly, in reference to the movie Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, where there are geese who are laying eggs and they get put on a meter, and if they're a good egg, they're taken by an Oompa Loompa, and if they're a bad egg, they're shot down the garbage chute. That famous scene from the movie Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, which, actually, trivia note, that scene was not in the book Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Actually, Tim Burton's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was actually more faithful to the Raw Doll book, but get beyond that, my new rating system is as follows. If a movie is great, I give it my rating of Knockout. If a movie is good, I give it my rating of Checkout. If my movie is bad, I give it a rating of Strikeout. And if the movie is terrible and not worth watching, I give it the rating of Flunkout. So my rating system is now Knockout, Checkout, Strikeout, Flunkout. So Hot Pursuit is not a terrible movie. There are some moments where it has its laughs. And it is definitely well worth staying towards the end to see the bloopers. Because the bloopers did actually make me laugh. But the movie itself, without the bloopers, not that great. And I give it my rating of Strikeout. And I think Reese Witherspoon has done better. And Sofia Vergara definitely has done better on TV. She's been in a few movies, uh, some of which were not that great, like Machete Kills. And some that actually were really good, like Chef. But I think for her to be a legitimate comedic actress, she needs to do something better. And I think she has the talent, and I do mean comedic talent, to do that. It's just, in Modern Family, she comes off as a lot more naturally funny, uh, despite being drop-dead gorgeous, which can be a liability in comedy to some people, than Sofia Vergara does in the movie Hot Pursuit. So... Unfortunately, I wanted Hot Pursuit to be better. I think if you're looking for a good comedy and you don't want to see The Avengers Age of Ultron, it might be a movie worth checking out, but overall, I give it my rating of Strikeout. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And the next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Maggie. 
Maggie is a movie that's been in limited release. And when I was running down the movies that are coming out this week, last week, I mentioned Maggie and I thought to myself, if this movie comes out in Boston, where my show is being broadcast, I am definitely going to go see it. So Maggie is a movie brand new that's in limited release right now, and I hope it gets the widespread release that Ex Machina is enjoying right now. It's a movie that stars Arnold Schwarzenegger and Abigail Breslin, and it is easily one of Arnold Schwarzenegger's most understated performances. And with Arnold Schwarzenegger in the, not the title role, but in the lead in the movie, arguably, he took this movie, the movie could have done, let me start that over. The movie could have gone in a different direction, almost more towards the Expendables type action movies, but it doesn't really go the action movie route. It is a horror movie, but it's more like a horror genre. So Maggie is about a teenage girl named Maggie who lives in the Midwest. I think she actually lives in Missouri or Kansas. Um, Kansas City is mentioned in the movie, but the state I don't believe is specified. But anyway... So this girl, Maggie, becomes infected by an outbreak of a disease that slowly turns the infected into cannibalistic zombies. During her, transfer During her transformation, her loving father stays by her side. So, of course, Maggie is Abigail Breslin from Little Miss Sunshine, who, in this movie, is proving herself to be a fine young actress, for lack of a better word. But, basically... She shows Abigail Breslin in this movie that her, not her first role, but her most prominent role in Little Miss Sunshine was not just a fluke. It was not just a stroke of beginner's luck. This movie shows that Abigail Breslin has some real acting chops. And it also shows that Arnold Schwarzenegger, who's been out of the acting scene for a while because he was governor, but then returned to do his standard action movies, actually has more acting clout than a lot of people give him credit for having. G granted, a lot of his movies, most of his movies have been action films, but this movie kind of shows that he has another side to him. And I'm not talking the comedic side he's shown in movies like Kindergarten Cop and Junior and... I am counting out Jingle All the Way because even though that's, to some, a movie classic, I never thought it was especially that great a movie, but regardless. Arnold Schwarzenegger in this movie shows he can act dramatically well as well. So what sets Maggie apart from other zombie movies is sort of the rules about zombies in this movie. In a lot of other zombie movies... Somebody who's bitten by a zombie almost turns into a zombie instantly. Or it takes not that much time for an infected person to turn into a zombie. In World War Z, it took place within seconds, as it did in 28 Days Later. Well, Maggie kind of shows that somebody can be bitten by a zombie, and they have two weeks to sort of get their affairs in order, and almost sort of contemplate death, so to speak. And I think for that reason, Maggie sets itself apart from other horror movies in its genre aspect in the sense that it's about regret, it's about families and what an infection, not just a fictional zombie infection, but almost the inevitable death of one of their loved ones can do to the entire family. How certain people will react and how certain people will deal with the oncoming disease. So I think in that sense, Maggie has more of a wide ranging set of potential subjects and can even <laughs> trigger debate more so than your typical horror movie. And I think Maggie is an encouraging trend, or represents an encouraging trend, amongst horror movies these days. And it's reminiscent to It Follows, in a sense, that there's some sort of consequential action that happens through no direct fault of the protagonist's own, and yet 
It's about dealing with the horrors that protrude into one's life, not necessarily running away from a certain horror, although there is that element there. So there aren't a lot of really scary parts or that happen. There aren't a lot of scary parts that happen in the movie Maggie. There are some startling moments, and there are some moments that keep you on the edge of your seat, especially as the zombie disease of Abigail Breslin progresses. But overall, it's a movie that actually makes you feel really bad for the protagonist, and that's a really good thing, both for Arnold Schwarzenegger's character and Abigail Breslin's character. Also of note is a supporting performance by... Jolie Richardson, who plays the wife of Arnold Schwarzenegger and the stepmother of Abigail Breslin. There's almost sort of a family dynamic that reveals itself as the movie goes on. And you learn from the dialogue that Jolie Richardson's character is well-meaning, but there are elements of her character that don't how do I put this? There is still some tension between Maggie and Caroline, Abigail Breslin and Julie Richardson's characters, respectively, that haven't gone away and almost reveal themselves more with this infection as time progresses and as the moments of challenge and controversy present themselves. So Maggie is a movie that has some slow parts, almost too slow sometimes, and I thought that the jittery camera and the almost excessive close-ups were a little much sometimes, but I give, my, I give Maggie my rating of checkout, because it's definitely a worth, worth, it's a movie worth checking out, and I think even non-horror fans will like this movie immensely. It could be a crossover success, if it's released in enough theaters that non-horror movie fans will definitely enjoy. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic Dan Burke, and usually this is around the time of the show where I review another movie. However, I only saw two movies this week, and I'm going to see more next week for sure, especially since two huge movies are coming out this coming weekend. So this is usually around the time of the show where I give you my list of movies that are coming out and what I might think of them. Now, I do have to say that as a movie critic that's bordering on professional, I like to say, I will become a professional movie critic eventually, but right now I'm just doing this sort of on my own time for fun and building my reputation at that. I am going on a steady diet of movie previews. So a lot of the times when I can avoid them, I try to ignore movie previews. The, a couple of weeks ago, this movie preview actually made the news, and when it did, the preview for Star Wars Episode Seven: The Force Awakens made it to the news, and when it did, I plugged my ears and went, la la la, as the, 
as the news report went on. No, I, I actually didn't, but I made sure to face away from the TV screen. I don't want to have any movie build my expectations too high. But then again, there are a lot of movies I'm excited about seeing just because I'm very curious about them. And there are certainly no exceptions. And the movies I'm about to tell you are certainly no exceptions. Mad Max Fury Road, the first Mad Max movie not to involve Mel Gibson, at least not that I know of, is coming out this weekend on Friday, May 15th. It stars Tom Hardy, Charlize Theron, Nicholas Holt, and Zoe Kravitz, amongst others. So, in a stark desert landscape where humanity is broken, two rebels just might be able to restore order. Max, a man of action and a few words, and Furiosa, a woman of action who's looking to make it back to her childhood homeland. So, I don't know if Mad Max Fury Road was filmed in Australia or not, or if the Australians have anything to do with this movie, but I don't know. The movie looks really great. I'm not sure if Mel Gibson is gonna, going to make a cameo appearance in this movie. I think Mad Max is advertised so as it is emphasizing the fact that Mad Max was a great trilogy back in the 70s and 80s, and not the fact that Mel Gibson held it up by his shoulders. Or at least the trailers and the publicity surrounding the movie is pretty much in denial of Mel Gibson's existence. And for certain reasons in that, Mel Gibson is considered box office poison. Not to me, I, I'll, I'll see whatever he's in, but to a lot of other people, and I will say for a good reason. But moving on, at also being released in theaters this coming weekend is the highly anticipated Pitch Perfect 2, directed by Elizabeth Banks and starring Anna Kendrick, Rebel Wilson, Brittany Snow, and Haley Steinfeld. Kendrick, Wilson, and Snow, both of the original movie, which also features an appearance from Elizabeth Banks and John Michael Higgins, both reprising their roles. And Haley Steinfeld is one of the newcomers in this movie. And so the movie is about sort of a follow-up. It is definitely a follow-up to the original Pitch Perfect, but... After a humiliating command performance at Lincoln Center, the Barden Bellas enter an international competition that no American group has ever won in order to regain their status and right to perform. So Pitch Perfect 2 sounds a little bit more cliched in plot than the original Pitch Perfect, but there are definitely probably going to be a lot more... I said definitely probably... Uh, Ignore I said that. There are probably going to be a lot more a cappella performances, unique ones and great ones, that are probably going to elevate this movie beyond its seemingly hackneyed plot. And I say seemingly because I haven't seen the movie, so I really can't say if it's cliched or not. But either way, I'll enjoy it both because the music's going to be great and I love Anna Kendrick, I love Rebel Wilson, and I like the other women in this movie, so it should be really good. And plus, after Anna Kendrick has been in Into the Woods and the last five years, the former of which was heavier than a lot of people probably thought it would be going into the movie, and the latter of which was downright sad. It was a great movie, but it was sad. People are probably going to be looking a lot more forward to seeing Anna Kendrick in a musical that's actually upbeat and has a potentially happy ending. But I'm just speculating. The other movies that are going to be coming out this coming weekend are going to be in limited release, so I can't say whether or not these movies are going to be great or that they're going to be coming out of the theater near you. Because in Boston, it's sort of up in the air, where you are in rural America, and I'm making huge, um, I'm making huge predictions about who's listening to me. I can't guarantee they're going to be released in your theater. That's all I'm going to say. So there's a movie coming out called "I'll See You in My Dreams." It's about a widow and former songstress who discover that life can begin anew at any age. The movie stars Blythe Danner, Blythe Danner. Martin Starr, Sam Elliott, and Malin Ackerman, amongst other people. 
It looks a lot like a movie similar to Terms of Endearment, if you want to call it that, but I'm not saying it's a ripoff, I'm just saying the plot is similar. One of the seven Hollywood plots. There's another movie out starring Ethan Hawke called Good Kill. It's about a family man who begins to question the ethics of his job as a drone pilot. So it's probably set in the post-apocalyptic world. In addition to Ethan Hawke, it stars January Jones, Zoe Kravitz, and Bruce Greenwood. So I'd be interested in seeing that movie, just because I like Ethan Hawke, and of course, I'm always down for an action movie. The Connection is a movie that's coming out this coming weekend in limited release. It's a French movie, and it's about a French police magistrate who spends years trying to take down one of the country's most powerful drug rings. And it doesn't star many famous people on this side of the Atlantic, but the person who stars in the movie is actually Jean Dujardin, the Academy Award winner from the movie The Artist from four years ago, who's still popping up in movies here and there. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host, Dan Burke, and I'm going down the list of movies that are going to be coming out very soon, potentially at a theater near you, but sometimes not, like one of these limited releases that's called Set Fire to the Stars. And Set Fire to the Stars is about an aspiring poet in 1950s New York who has his ordered world shaken when he embarks on a week-long retreat to save his hell-raising hero, Dylan Thomas. The movie stars Elijah Wood and a couple of other unknown actors, or at least actors that aren't known to me, uh, Selen Jones, Kelly Riley, and Stephen McIntosh. If you know these actors, then pat yourself on the back. But if not, um, it's based, actually, Set Fire to the Stars is based on a book by John Malcolm Brennan, which is called Dylan Thomas in America. But I'd be interested in seeing that if it's opening at a, theater near, at a theater near me. Another movie of note in limited release that's coming out this weekend is a movie called The Film Critic, which I think comes out of South America. Because nobody I know is in it, and they all have Spanish names. They have Spanish first names, but last names that don't sound Spanish. But anyway, moving on. The film critic is about a prestigious film critic who has lost faith in the art form who sparks with a young woman whose tastes run opposite of his. Could this be autobiographical? <laughs> um, maybe not, but <laughs> it, it's a movie I kind of wish would happen to me other than the losing faith in the art form, which obviously I've never done there or haven't done yet, and I hope not to. I still... I'm very excited about going to the movies, and I'm always taken aback by movies that I see. And I don't necessarily view every movie as a waste of time, but <laughs> ask me again after I see something terrible, like some spoof movie that comes out. But regardless, so that's about it with movies that, have, that are coming out on May 15th. Might as well, while I have time, check out the movies that are coming out on May 22nd. And believe me, I have a lot of time. So one of the movies of note that's coming out on May 22nd is Tomorrowland. This is a movie that's produced by Walt Disney, or the Walt Disney Company, 
that is another movie that's based on a ride at Disney World and originally Disneyland, I think. So movies that are based on rides at Disney World could go either way. They could be great, like Pirates of the Caribbean and the movies that followed, or they could be terrible, like The Haunted Mansion starring Eddie Murphy. But actually, they're making a remake of The Haunted Mansion, which hopefully will be better than the Eddie Murphy version, but again, I don't know. Tomorrowland has promise, though, and it's about a teen, a teen girl, who's bound by a shared destiny. L let me try to read the plot of the movie without sounding like it's coming from me and not from IMDb. Bound by a shared destiny, a teen bursting with scientific curiosity and a former boy genius inventor embark on a mission to unearth the secrets of a place somewhere in time and space that exists in their collective memory. The movie stars George Clooney, Britt Robertson, Hugh Laurie, and Raffi Cassidy, amongst other people. So, I haven't seen the previews for this, but considering that George Clooney is in it, and it's directed by Brad Bird who was known primarily for being an animation director, having directed The Incredibles, and I think Ratatouille he also directed. But in terms of live-action movies, he directed Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, starring Tom Cruise, Simon Pegg, Jeremy Renner, and I'm blanking on the woman's name, but she is the ex-wife of Robin Thicke. Again, I'm blanking on her name right now, but she's a great actress. Trust me on that one. But the point is that Brad Bird has proven himself with the fourth Mission Impossible movie to be as competent a director in live action as he was in animation. It's not to say that a live action director is necessarily better than an animation director, but animation involves a different kind of directing than live action, that's certainly no doubt. So also coming out on May 22nd is the remake of Poltergeist. They're starting a franchise all new again and have a lot of really good actors to sort of build up this new Poltergeist. So this is the first Poltergeist movie in 23 years and a remake, most definitely, of the original one. So the f a family whose suburban home is haunted by evil forces must come together to rescue their youngest daughter after the apparitions take her captive. So it's exactly the same plot as the original. Poltergeist is also rated PG-13. The original Poltergeist from 1982 was rated, uh, excuse me, was rated PG, not R, and that was before the PG-13 rating was implemented. Had the movie been released after 1984, it probably would have been rated PG-13, but it's rated PG, which has tricked kids of all ages since then. But the movie stars Sam Rockwell, Rosemary DeWitt, and Jared Harris, amongst other people. And I think the girl in the movie, in this movie, is played by Saxon Charbino. Although I could be wrong about that. She might be a teenage actress. But either way, Saxon Charbino is in this movie. And another movie that's coming out of interest next weekend, May 22nd, is a movie called When Marnie Was There. This is a movie that's coming out of Studio Ghibli. It's not directed by Miyazaki. It's directed by Hiromasa Yonibayashi. And it's about a young girl who is sent to the country for health reasons where she meets an unlikely friend in the form of Marnie, a young girl with flowing blonde hair. As the friendship unravels, it is possible that Marnie has closer ties to the protagonist than we might expect. So, when Marnie is there is opening on May 22nd, but I don't have any information on whether it's going to be opening in the United States or not. My guess is that Walt Disney Pictures will be distrib distributing this, very similar to the other Studio Ghibli movies it has distributed. But I don't know who the American voice actors in the movie will be, if there are any. But rest assured, Studio Ghibli has usually been known to do surprisingly well in the States, so we might see it here.
Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host, Dan Burke, and thank you so much for tuning into the show. I just want to say that it has been an absolute pleasure discussing films with you for this show. It's, it's a pleasure every year, but right now I've sort of forgotten, or I haven't forgotten, but I've almost, I've run out of films to review, and I think I've spoken enough about the movies that are coming out in theaters this weekend and next weekend. But I might as well give you a little bit of movie news, and I'm trying to make it so that I don't just read movie news off of a site like HitFix or something like that, but there are movies that are coming out at Cannes this year, and I wanted to actually go to Cannes, but unfortunately I didn't get around to writing my permission slip to go to Cannes. But maybe next year. Maybe I'll catch it in 2016 when it will be in even bigger cans than last year. Or rather this year. But I really can't say uh, whether or not next year will be bigger than this year. But either way, it'll be bigger for me because I will make a point to be there. Yay! So there are a couple of English language films that are screening at cans in competition. Or at least I think there are. Uh, or at least I think these movies are screening in competition, but maybe they're just studio fare and they're being screened out of competition. But a movie I'm looking forward to greatly, Pixar's new movie Inside Out, the first Pixar movie in two years, is one I'm very excited to see. Mad Max Fury Road is also screening at HitFix, and I'll tell you all about that movie. Or Excuse me, did I say HitFix? Mad Max Fury Road is also debuting at, or being screened, at Cannes this year. And I'll tell you all about that movie when I see it on next show. And Woody Allen is coming out with a new movie, Irrational Man, which stars Joaquin Phoenix and Parker Posey, amongst other people. And Woody Allen's movie, I don't think is screening in Cannes, although it might actually do pretty well at Cannes. Who knows? But they're all... But there are movies that are being hyped um, at Cannes that are of note, according to HitFix. There is a movie called Love that is directed by Gaspar No, who I've never heard of, but you might be hearing about him in the coming weeks. The movie, according to HitFix, is already being hyped as the sex-crazed movie everyone thought Lars von Trier's Nymphomaniac was going to be. There's also going to be a, an Amy Winehouse documentary, that's already stirring up some controversy, even though it hasn't come out yet. That documentary is going to, going to be called Amy. And there's a movie starring Colin Farrell, which is a detective movie starring that's called The Lobster. And that would be cool if that movie comes uh, takes place in Maine, but my guess is that it m may or may not, but I can't really say anything about it because I don't have the plot details. I only have the name of the movie and that's really about it. So I can't tell you anything more than that. I can also tell you that John C. Riley has not one but three movies that are going to be screening at Cannes. And I'm not sure how John C. Riley is viewed outside of the U.S., but here in America, particularly on this show, he's Definitely an actor worth seeing in whatever he's in, even if it's terrible. He's usually good in it. And Natalie Portman is actually making her directorial debut, or screening her directorial debut at Cannes. So there are a lot of movies that I unfortunately won't be able to see. I will just tell you all about them when I... Or I'll just tell you what I potentially could think of them. I'll be one of those poor kids who's standing at the outside of the screening as I hear people laughing inside, and I just lean my head against the proverbial movie wall and cry my eyes out because everybody else is having a great time at the movies except for me. Wow, that just makes me sad totally saying that. But even though this, art, this movie wasn't potentially... wasn't mentioned in the HitFix article, there is a picture at the top of this article uh, that's entitled The Movies You Need to Pay Attention to at Cannes 2015 and Why 
that shows Salma Hayek after burying her face in what looks like a bloody turkey carcass. And she's looking up at the camera with a serious face and what looks to be blood or barbecue sauce. I would like to think since she's in an independent film, it's the former rather than the latter, all over the bottom of her face. So that movie looks interesting, and I'm not sure if it's an actual movie that you might see, but lo and behold, there's actually a one of these slideshows of movies you should pay attention to at Cannes. So let's see what we have here. So there's a movie directed by Gus Van Sant called The Sea of Trees, which stars Matthew McConaughey, Naomi Watts, and Ken Watanabe. So why you should care about this movie, according to HitFix, McConaughey is on such a roll, his performance in Interstellar is actually underrated. Van Sant, on the other hand, hasn't made a good movie since 2008... Since 2008's Milk, we can just forget how bad Restless and Promised Land were and pray ere he's due, right? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't seen Restless or Promised Land, so I can't tell you how those movies were. But Gus Van Sant, whatever he's directing, it's usually worth seeing. Even if it's a bad movie, it usually has its merits. But regardless, there's also a movie called Youth, which... Stars Michael Caine, Rachel Weisz, Jane Fonda, Paul Dano, and Harvey Keitel. I can't exactly tell you what the movie's about, but it boasts a very good cast. And there are some other movies, including a movie called Louder Than Bombs, which stars Jesse Eisenberg with short, straight hair, according to this picture I'm seeing of him. And the movie also stars Amy Ryan, Gabriel Byrne, David Strayhair, and Isabel Huppert. So, it's directed by a Norwegian filmmaker by the name of Joachim Tier, Trier, rather. Joachim Trier. That's as best as I'm going to pronounce that name. But anyway, that's all for Words on Film for this week. I'm your host, Dan Burke. Thank you so much for tuning into my show, and I will see you next week at the movies. Take care and so long. Hi, I'm Dan Burke, movie critic and host of Words on Film. You can hear my show on Tuesdays at 1 p.m. on Boston Free Radio. Check me out at bostonfreeradio.com.